time of our last anniversary, we had just beaten the enemy at Peleliu and were making plans for new landing operations. Operations that would pit us against the best and final defenses of the enemy in the Pacific. We, the officers and men of the Marine Corps, knew that we would succeed. But we also knew that the battles ahead would be as hard and as bitter as any in which the Marines had been engaged. So we prepared for those battles. But halfway between Guam and Japan was a tiny pork chop of an island, Iwo Jima. As a Japanese air base, it was a menace to our B-29s. To make it an American air base was the mission of the 5th Amphibious Corps, the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions. The fleet poured it on, and we stood off, waiting for the bombardment to lift. Our landing craft went in under direct observation from grim Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano that commanded the landing area. They could practically read our dog tanks coming in, but we kept coming. The beach was enfiladed and looked like high tide in hell. The sand was soft, volcanic ash. You could hardly walk on it. It bogged down everything on wheels and even most of the stuff with tracks. But we weren't going very far anyway. We moved off the beach as soon as we could. But from Suribachi, the Japs had us zeroed in anywhere on the island. All we could do with the rock was cut it off and climb it. Aviation helped us by softening it up around the edges. To us, putting the flag on Suribachi meant mostly that the Japs had lost their main observation post. And to the men down around sea level, it meant that the odds would be more even. But there were a couple of airfields to take, and quite a few thousand Japs didn't want us to take them. They were dug in, and we had to dig them out. We used everything in the book, and then threw the book at them. The Japanese were cagey. They didn't waste their strength in suicide tactics, spectacular bonsai charges. They held their ground and died hard. It took us a month to secure Iwo, and the cost was high, but so was the gain. Aviation based here could support all future operations and save more lives than had been lost in the war to date. We're here with Warrant Officer Williams, Woody, uh, Herschel Woody Williams. Let's talk as much as you're comfortable about your role as the chaplain for the Medal of Honor Society and for, the, for this group of men. What is that like? Well, it's one of the greatest honors and privilege 
that uh, has come into my life. I never dreamed that I would ever be in that role. I can recall the first time that another Medal of Honor recipient and I were in Detroit. We were at a convention, and he and I noticed that we would have a meeting, and at that time we were having 200 or almost 300 Medal of Honor recipients in attendance. There was never any prayer uh, or invocation, that type thing, that took place before the meeting. His name was Stanley Bender, and he was a pretty devoted Catholic. So we went to the people who were running the committee and convention and asked if uh, if we could have prayer before starting the meeting. And the individual at that point was of the opinion that we didn't need prayer. Now, he wasn't a Marine. If he'd have been a Marine, I could have better understood it. You know, Marines are, get that impression. Sometimes they feel they are totally self-sufficient. They don't even need God. But you put them in the right spot. Amen. <clears throat> You know, they do, and they admit that, but maybe not afterwards. And I'm one of those. <clears throat> I know I'm not answering your question directly, but I will. You're fine. <laughs> I was not raised in a uh, Christian home. We had no Christian upbringing. We didn't even have a church in the community in which I was raised. We did have a Bible. It was used as a record-keeping Bible, not as a reading Bible. It was never opened unless they were going to record a birth or a death or a marriage. And then it was opened and that was the record because at that time those records were not placed in courthouses because the courthouse was a long ways away. There was no doctor in attendance birth. There were 11 in our family, and none of us ever had a doctor when we were born. So our birth certificates or marriage records were never recorded in courthouses. That Bible was the official book. And that's all we knew about it. When I got into combat, I really didn't know God. But I got into some tough situations. I knew there was a power of some sort that could save me. And I prayed to that power, whatever it was. I, as I said, I, I didn't have any background. Uh, I tell the story, which is true, when I was going into the Marine Corps. We filled out the application, and we had the list the next of kin and who who's to receive our personal effects and all that sort of thing. There was a block there that said religion. I had no idea what to put in that. Happened to be standing behind a, an Italian boy who had been raised as a Catholic. So I looked over at his paper and he had a C in there. Aha! That's what you're supposed to put in there. <clears throat> so I put a C. And when I got my dog tags, it uh, had on there a C. I still didn't know what that meant. And somebody told me that means that you're a Catholic. It's okay. And I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I'm a Catholic. That's right. So I just, just took that. But uh, Stanley Bender, who was a army recipient from Europe. <clears throat> Older than I, <clears throat> Stan wasn't even drafted until he was 35 years old. He had never married, he was single, that made him eligible for draft, and they were drafting up to 38 at that time. So Stan ended up in Europe, and 
knock out some tanks with bazookas and receive the Medal of Honor. So Tank uh, uh, Stanley was a practicing Catholic, and he and I both were concerned the fact that there was nothing ever said about God or religion or whatever. And, of course, that happened after uh, 1962 when God grabbed me one day in church and turned me around and headed me in another direction. So we had a uh, chaplain, eventually, for the Medal of Honor Society. His name was Desmond Doss. Desmond was uh, a conscientious objector. So Desmond had reached a point in health that he decided he would give up being the chaplain. And Ron Ray, who is a recipient, came to me and asked me if I would take the, uh, Desmond's pl uh, place as chaplain. Uh, I was extremely honored, but still frightened, because uh, to do that was something that I'd never dreamed of, never really didn't think I was prepared for. But uh, from the day that the Lord grabbed me and turned me around, I had been teaching a Sunday school class. Uh, one of the things that the pastor did that uh, finally convinced me I needed God was as soon as he got somebody in his church that changed his belief and accepted Christ, he put him to work doing something. And he did me. Uh, he did go to his classes with me. I was teaching a, a married class, and he went to class with me, and he would help me teach the class for a period of time, and then finally he got out of the folk picture, and I've been, I've been teaching Sunday school, school class ever since. I'm teaching those old folk now. So I'm, I'm too young to qualify? Or could you I could not in? qualify to I, get I in my class. I couldn't sneak in one Sunday? You, you, can, you can sit and listen. Could participate. No. That's, no, I'm kidding. Of course so you can. So am I. Of course you can participate. But <clears throat> we have different classes, and you'd be in another class. You would enjoy the other one more than ours, maybe. But uh, it's, it is a great pleasure. And to be the chaplain of this group of people, you know, none of them should be alive. There shouldn't be a one of us alive. And if it wasn't for a miracle created by God, we wouldn't be alive. We wouldn't be here. So it is quite a challenge, and I know that we have some who have still not accepted the fact that they lived through a miracle, and God saved their life. They haven't accepted that yet. I hope they do. We certainly want them to. Amen. So it's a, it's a great, great thrill, great pleasure. Well, with that role, and as much as you're comfortable talking about it, one of the things that struck me about this kinship and this group of men is the, like you said, when, when you became part of it, there were 200 something, and now there's... 87, will be 87 soon. Yeah, because of new inductee. Yes. It's, it, and there's so many fewer inductees coming in whether that's because of the way we fight wars or because of the way they're selected or and the new inductees are a lot so many of them are posthumous now that's right uh, so we're losing these men but, but as a chaplain you get to participate in the memorial services yes how comfortable are you talking about that Well, to say that you like to do something like that, I guess, would be, <clears throat> would be wrong. But I, I consider it very, very important that we do have a memorial service, that we do not forget these individuals. Uh, we lost 10 of them since our last convention. 
that number is going to grow larger as we go on down the road a little ways. And unless there is another war, we eventually will not have a Congressional Medal of Honor Society as we know it. We won't have any members. Uh, it's been my prayer ever since I knew what to do, how to pray, that we'd never have another because the percentage factor of the recipients, better than 50% of them never lived to actually receive the medal. And if we don't have wars, we won't have any more medals. So then, wouldn't that be great, yeah, that we absolutely. never have any more wars? Okay. The six that have uh, been awarded from Afghanistan and Iraq, now, now seven, uh, on the sixth will be the eighth. And if and when they decide to recognize and give the award to the living recipient, will be the ninth. Out of 1.7 millions of people who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, to have that number, that small number, is a little troubling to me because I have read incidents where I believe that had that person done what he did in Iraq or Afghanistan, in any other war, he would have been recognized with the Medal of Honor. Now why that is true, I don't know the answer to it. I just believe that percentage-wise, and that's not a good thing to use, but, but numbers-wise, with the number who have served, the number who have been in combat, and they only have that number of awardees. It seems to me that they apparently changed the rules somewhere along the way to make it more difficult or to uh, select those who did do the final sacrifice. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that's it. I don't know. Right. In your prayer the other day, you, you talked about um the faith of America as a country. What would you say in that? If you could, if you could pray for our country right now, what would your prayer be? That we would return to our roots of belief. We were formed by people who firmly believed that God had a hand in what we were doing and what was going to happen to America. And it seems to me like. We have forgotten that. Uh, our beliefs, basic beliefs, are the same. Our participation and acceptance of those beliefs have all changed. Our values that once we held, just use a simple example, our sanctuaries in our churches at one time was a holy ground like Moses was walking on. We have sort of lost that somewhere along the way. Our churches, our sanctuaries are not nearly what they used to be. Uh, at one time we would never dream to have a band with drums and all that sort of thing playing in the sanctuaries. That, that wasn't you know, where it belonged. I'm not saying that's wrong. I know that religion has changed over the years. And it will continue to do so. But those basic core values, to me, are disappearing. And if with those disappear, then we lose our religion. If, if we lose our religion, we may lose our country, in my opinion. I agree, 100%. We're, we're going down the drain. When you, when you have no... No belief beyond yourself, and that's what you get when you don't have any other belief. Uh, you, you can't make it. You can't make it in this world alone. And, you know, one place in my citation that says the words or has the words, and I had nothing to do with this, nobody ever came to me and said, what do you want in this citation? There's no words in there that belongs to me. 
that he went forward alone. I did not. Number one, I had God with me. Didn't even know it, but I did. And I had many other Marines with me. So I was not alone. I may have been out there by myself at that particular point. There wasn't anybody giving me any competition or trying to do more than what I was doing. But I sure wasn't alone. And we can't, we can't exist alone. I feel like, speak to, if you could, you know, how the Lord may have used you because of the metal to do, you know, you've got a different audience than maybe you would have if you didn't have the metal. Does that make sense? Well, yes, it makes some sense. It does. <clears throat> I'm positive in my own mind. I would not be doing what I do. I would have not lived the life that I have lived. I would have not had the opportunities that have come my way had it not been for the Medal of Honor. I have said many, many times that the day that President Truman put this thing around my neck, my life changed. I, I, I was not the same person the day after as I was the day before because it placed on me an opportunity to represent something beyond myself. And the day after I received the medal, we Marines were told we would be uh, interviewed <clears throat> or visit the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And in my day, the Commandant of the Marine Corps was pretty close to God. Uh, whatever he said went, that's for sure. And I've, I've said I don't know whether I was more frightened when I was standing before the president or when I had to walk in the office of the Commandant of the Marine Corps by myself. I think the second one I was really, because I had more time to think about it and knew what was coming on. Uh, when I got to Washington and received the medal and they told us we were going to be over to the White House, I didn't even know what the White House was. That didn't mean a whole lot. But I sure knew who the Commandant of the Marine Corps or knew what he represented. I didn't know him, but I knew what it represented. And he told me, as I stood before his desk, one of the very first things he said to me, that medal does not belong to you. And he was a very stern individual. Reminded me a little bit of my dad. He said it belongs to all those Marines who didn't get to come home. And he said then, don't ever do anything that would tarnish that medal. So I became a representative at that point in time. And that's why in this Medal of Honor book, it, it, it says that I'm just the caretaker of the medal because I believed him, and I still do, that it really doesn't belong to me. If I wasn't for those other Marines, I wouldn't even be here, and I certainly would not have received the Battle of Honor. We were with you yesterday when you went to the high school, and I watched 300 high school students hanging on every word, which really struck I got teenagers. I got, I got a... a a middle schooler and a high schooler, too. So to see <laughs> see high schoolers and teenagers hanging on every word, uh, I wish you could bottle that and sell that. You know, parents would buy that. Um, how does that make you feel? And and what do what what do you, how does how does that make you feel? And, and what what's special about that? Or what do you hope to accomplish with with those visits? Well, I hope that they will accept the fact that they, and only they, can be in control of their life. We can be taught, we can be persuaded, but eventually, when it comes right down to it, you're the person that must decide what you're gonna do with your life. 
Certainly you can be influenced by others, as all of us are. And as I usually say in those presentations to schools and colleges, I'd like to do that. I, I really do. I enjoy that. But all of us have these role models that do influence our life. And we can select which one we're going to accept. So I'm hoping that something I say will get them to thinking. Here's an individual and look how, what type of a life they have and what they have, where they are. If I do basically the same thing, I can get there too. I have a philosophy that I have developed, I guess, didn't always have it, that life is a gift from God. And what we do with that life is our gift back to God. I believe that. I believe he has a purpose for every life. I don't think I would be here without that purpose. I'm still not sure what that total purpose is. And I have said a number of times that when I get to heaven, and I'm still planning on going there, one of the questions I'm going to ask God is, why me? Why was I spared when those around me weren't? What was the difference? I hope to get an answer to that sometime. Because right now, I don't know that answer. Uh, when uh, I went into the Marine Corps, I was dating a young lady that I think she was just born a Christian. And she certainly had a tremendous influence on my life. We became engaged. When I came home, I married her immediately. I'd been gone for almost three years. <clears throat> and she kept trying to convince me, not forcefully in any way, but by what she did and how she lived, that there's a better way of living than what I was doing. But I was a Marine. I don't need that. I'm self-sufficient. She is. But eventually that changed when Christ came into my life. So she and my two daughters certainly influenced my thinking of what life is all about. And that there is a better way than what I was headed. Had I continued down the road that I was headed, I possibly wouldn't even, not that I wouldn't be living, I think I'd be living, but I probably would not be active in this organization, the Medal of Honor Society, and I know I would not be going out to schools and talking to young people or having any influence on their life. I think you have to believe what you are trying to live.